Hello, my name is Alan Foom and today I'm going to talk about geological interpretation. Is it a science? Is it an art? So here you have a seismic section with a pencil. Now back in the old days, you used to basically color these things in. Now my mother was a geophysicist. When I was a child, I had to color in a seismic section. So I have over 50 years of seismic interpretation experience. Here is what we actually do. So we take data, we take knowledge, put these together with interpretation to make an earth model. From that, we get information on reserves and resources, risk and reward, an understanding of uncertainty. And from that, we use that, that interpretation to make decisions. So that's basically what we do. So this uh, video is uh, inspired uh, by an article that a veteran geologist called Jan de Jäger, who's Excel, wrote in GeoExpro magazine. GeoExpro is an excellent magazine. I would highly recommend getting it, um, edited by a man called Han Combrick, who does excellent work. And this is uh, Jan's basic uh, comments. So geological interpretation is an art, but it's based on solid science. And it's become more quantitative as time has progressed, as technology has advanced. But the imagination, creativity, and art remains. So this is a quote, direct quote from him. So exploration geology has definitively changed. We have great and deeper knowledge of many aspects of the exploration game. Thanks to the more quantitative approach taken when de-risking a prospect. But just because we can calculate some seemingly very precise numbers, it does not mean that outcomes are necessarily correct. The input for such calculation modeling is as sizes always are, and to a greater extent will be uncertain. So managing uncertainty, looking at risk using our imagination, but based on solid science. So here's some prejudices about science and arts. Now, I think these prejudices are nonsense, but they have widely held, so let's talk about them. So science is seen as being rational, evidence-based, calculating, procedural, definitive, in fact, a bit cold, really. Whereas art is seen as being something warmer, something imaginative, based on hunches, intuition, free willing, open interpretation, and narratives. Well, geology kind of does both. Um, and this is when CP2, CP Snow, this chap here, two cultures do meet. So what do geologists actually do? So we got data. We are the original data scientists. We take this data that's often incomplete, sometimes contradictory. We try to make sense of it. We then interpret this data to get geological meaning. We integrate this interpretation to a coherent model or several models to manage the uncertainty. Then we produce forecast scenarios that try to gauge risk and reward. And these outputs are used to make decisions regarding locating oil wells, estimating reserves, chance of success, and managing operations safely. Quite a lot of stuff there. Some definitive, some less so. So two basic types of geologists. Now the two kind of do really blend, but again, these are two end members. So one end we have specialists, gurus. They're experts in a relatively narrow field, be it sedimentology, biostratigraphy, um, gravity magnetics, seismic processing. They're very highly trained. I mean, these people have PhDs. They're some of the brightest people you'll ever meet in your life. Their work tends to be more procedural, a bit like forensic science and uh, police work. And it's about finding the evidence. And then you have integrators and generalists. They tend to have a broader perspective. They're still pretty highly trained. I mean, you need a master's degree, basically, but they're not quite as bright as the people on the on the left. They follow procedures, but there's a little bit more room for deviation, a little bit more room for making different judgments. But again, you need to have the experience of judgment of when the procedures need to be followed and when the things are deviated. Obviously, anything safety related, you follow procedures to the letter. And you try to compile the evidence to try to solve the puzzle. So a little bit about advances in interpretation. So going from the 1960s to the 2020s, 1960s, you had 2D paper sections, manual contour maps. Seismic was just coming into its infancy in terms of interpretation seismic. In the 1970s, you had the first 3D data, digitizing sections, moving things into computer world because computing had advanced. A interesting thing called SciScrob, which is looking at time slices to make contour maps. And sequence photography began to start. I have a video on my channel about that. 1980s, you had the first computer workstations, Landmark, Zycor, you know, it takes me back to the back in the day with memories. Start of reservoir simulation. My stepfather had quite a lot to do with that. And initial work on seismic amplitudes, bright spots, flat spots, etc. In the 1990s, you had widespread 3D. Became less expensive. People did more of it. First depth migration. Looking at depth domain, again, I have a video on my channel on depth domain and pitfalls and possibilities. First, stochastic models, play fairway analysis, 4D seismic, QI, seismic inversion to try to get properties from seismic data. That started in the 1990s. In the 2000s, you had 3D visualization, so you're looking at something like that. 
integrated modeling, for example, Petrel, Skua, et cetera, GoCAD. Uh, Shell Gas started off in the UK, and that's very data intensive, very machine learning compared to conventional exploration because you have that much more data. More advanced QI, more advanced seismic conversion to get properties, CSEM control source, electromagnetics, gravity, gravity, geometry, et cetera. Again, quite a lot of progress. 2020s, you had US, 2010s, you had US shale, full waveform inversion, machine learning is starting, advanced death imaging is starting. So for example, here's a section from Doug, using full waveform inversion, getting more velocity properties from the data to kind of get you a brighter, better image. And moving into the 2020s, artificial intelligence, and we don't know what else will come through, but we have had a record of innovation. But the key point here is we're getting more quantitative, more information, putting it all together, more work to get to a right, better result, to get more accuracy. Risk and uncertainty. So risk is binary. It's either a chance of event occurring or chance of event not occurring. And uncertainty is given that an event actually has happened. Well, how big is it going to be? What's the magnitude? What's the range of outcomes? And we need to try to understand that and look at both of them separately in order to try to make better decisions and be aware of cognitive biases when we're estimating a risk. And there are a lot of biases. And I have a video on biases on my channel as well. Stochastic and deterministic. So this is the Church of Gauss in, uh, in Iceland. So deterministic models create a signal scenario. Back in the day, that's all we could do because everything took so long to make. And you wanted to get as close as possible to the single truth. Now, it's taken people quite a while to move away from that paradigm and you're getting technical pro prowess getting the answer yes that makes you feel great when you do that but unfortunately life's not quite like that where stochastic models have multiple scenarios you can also have multiple deterministic models recognizing there's a wide uncertainty trying to estimate the range trying to understand where you are because there could be more than one valid answer but each of these potential valid answers would have a probability of occurrence an interpretation is subjective so the answer is not always clear and different people can make different decisions, which is still valid from the same data. And more data specialist studies can make some interpretations invalid, but not always. So you have something like the confidence smile. You really want to get away from the center here where you have a 50-50 to either definitely or highly unlikely to happen or highly likely to happen. And that's what the technical work you do does. So you need to try to calculate the probability of chance success and individual biases can make people more certain than perhaps they really ought to be. Now, I've got a video on biases, and the former boss of mine, Mark Bond, who works for Rose Associates, does an excellent course on this, so please contact him. And this is from Visual Capitalists, so this is different biases that you will have. And the biases can lead us to, to affirm evidence that's consistent with our prior beliefs, the narrative story. We need to get away from that. And biases can also lead us to ignore evidence which contradicts our prior beliefs. Again, get away, getting away from the narratives. And the biases can lead us to make poor decisions either choosing poor projects or ignoring potentially good opportunities. Another myth within our industry is the explorer myth. So you've got some explorers, Christopher Columbus, Captain Cook, Jen Kay, various other people traveling around the world, finding new stuff. So a brave person has an idea they believe in, the idea is beyond the conventional wisdom, beyond the tradition, pushing the boundaries. Hero can be derided, but someone gives a hero a break and supports them. There may be setbacks, but the hero is eventually proven right. Yes, they do find a new continent, they do find new land, trading partners, etc. And there's a large and explored discovery, which makes the hero's company. Now, the myth has resulted in some great discoveries, which are celebrated, but also quite a lot of wasted money, which tends to be brushed under the carpet a bit. So, are we explorers? Yes, we are. But we're also something else. We're detectives. So, what do detectives do? They gather the clues, for example, forensics, uh, interviews with suspects, etc., and analyze the data and look at probabilities and use intuition and experience. So you use the little gray cells like Hilco Poirot, Sherlock Holmes, Miss Marple, Inspector Morse, Brother Catfile, Lord Peter Wimsey, etc. And they come up with a result, usually, but they do sometimes get it wrong because there have been miscarriages of, of justice. So be more detective. So look at what we do, taking data, taking knowledge and interpretation to make the model, analyzing it for resource and reserves, risk and probability, understanding an opportunity, using those insights to make decisions, just like a detective. And we create quite a lot of things, using delivery, safety and results, looking at curiosity, working as a team, analyzing, looking worldwide with different cultures and different people, using some pretty advanced technology, creating ideas, building on ideas, 
to solve problems. So I'm proud to be a geologist. Yes, it is a science, but it's also an art, but it's really a detective process. Understanding and managing complicated data, varying reliability and relevance, trying to sort the wheat from the chaff, quantifying risk and reserves, creating new ideas, new opportunities. So please, unleash your inner Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot, Inspector Morse. Detect, find, grow. Thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.